Good afternoon, my name is Dr. Jason Burnett and I'll be presenting on the third part of the Identifying and Intervening in Cases of Elder Abuse series and this presentation will focus on assessment of mental capacity. And this presentation is funded by a grant from the Health Resources and Services Administration of the Department of Health and Human Services. The grant was initially funded in 2007 with renewed funding for five years beginning in 2010. And so what we'll start with are the learning objectives for this presentation. So what we hope for the students to do is describe the standards of mental capacity assessments, list the components of mental capacity, and describe a new paradigm for mental capacity assessment. So we'll begin with a definition of elder abuse. So elder abuse is the intentional maltreatment of an older adult which aims to do harm in that person. And there's different types of elder abuse that occur. There's physical abuse, there's neglect, which includes self-neglect and caregiver neglect. There's emotional and psychological abuse, there's verbal abuse and threats, financial abuse and exploitation, there's sexual abuse and abandonment. And you've received information on these different types of elder abuse in prior presentations. And let's begin with a case example that really illustrates the problem that some older adults face when it comes to capacity and making decisions for themselves both medically and potentially even financially. So this is a patient that did not recognize that she had cancer and presented to the emergency department asking for liniment and ACE wrap and as you might expect this is a condition, as you can see on the presentation here, this is a condition that is far more advanced. It's something that liniment is not going to alleviate and an ACE wrap is definitely not going to be the answer. So what this illustrates is the disconnect between a person's ability to make sound, reasonable medical decisions and their inability to make these decisions. So let's move on and, and discuss capacity. And so here's some more subtle scenarios that you might see that are associated with capacity. Maybe non-adherence or non-compliance to medical uh, recommendations or medications. The patient seems to do well in the hospital, whereas when they come into the hospital, they may have been in really bad situations, living in unsanitary conditions, come in disheveled, very dirty, with multiple untreated conditions. But when you put them in an environment where someone is helping them and providing them with that care, then they do much better. The patient may decline interventions despite desire to get better, so there's incidents where you have an older adult who knows that they need to do what's recommended by the physician or by the healthcare professional or by someone who's trying to give them the proper care, but yet they decline this intervention because they don't fully understand or appreciate the recommendations that are being provided. And also the patient may live in squalor, and when we say squalor, we mean conditions that could almost be condemnable by the city or by another agency, yet they continue to live in this situation and choose to live in this situation, express a preference for that. And then the patient may also allow exploitation. And this is, this is a very serious condition where someone comes in and, and takes the, the money of an older adult or the assets of an older adult for their own personal financial gain which then leads the older adult to be dependent on their care and oftentimes leads to the inability to obtain medical help or get their medications as recommended and so in these situations where they're allowing exploitation it's obviously a threat to their health and survival. So what are the standards for mental capacity? Well capacity first is a it's a legal definition. It describes the cluster of mental skills that people use in their everyday lives. This includes memory, logic, the ability to calculate and the flexibility to turn one's attention from one task to another. And as we might suspect, these are all very important tasks for us to be able to function independently and safely in life. And especially whenever we're living alone, these become very important and even more important in populations where they have multiple chronic conditions or conditions that require constant medication and then also be able to address risky situations and come up with new ways of solving problems that may be affecting their quality of life or put them at risk for injury. And then capacity is also a medical diagnosis and physicians can conduct a capacity assessment. 
When this occurs, the court system decides using a physician assessment whether a patient has capacity, partial capacity, or no capacity. This is really an important piece because a lot of times these older adults may be living alone in their home and will need a medical diagnosis in order for service like Adult Protective Services to provide them with guardianship or some other care that will provide them the safety that they need to live independently in the community. So what is competence? Competence refers to a person's capacity to make rational informed decisions about his care or property. Now medical competence denotes a person's ability to understand and make informed medical decisions. When we really think about it, competence is a legal term whereas decision making capacity is a medical term. And so Continuing on with competence, if you have a patient that where there's evidence that questions a patient's capacity, this may lead to a formal assessment of competence by the clinician. And traditionally, mental health professionals such as psychiatrists and psychologists, they perform these tests, but most clinical situations, the primary clinician can assess competence. We do have different assessments for competence and capacity, which we'll discuss later on in this presentation, but one thing that we really need to consider is that mental health disorders such as Alzheimer's disease, depression, or schizophrenia, these don't necessarily make a person incompetent automatically, even if they have some obvious impairment. So what are the criterion for capacity? Well, the Applebaum and Griso criterion, the most commonly cited criterion for capacity, assess it by looking at attention, memory, language, awareness, and appreciation. And these will become very important, especially these referring to awareness and appreciation. So when a medical or psychiatric interview is being conducted, we want to make sure that the patient can recite the facts. So is the patient aware of the treatment choice? So if there's a treatment where that a person needs, are they aware of what this treatment choice is? And then we need to make sure they have reasons behind their decisions. It's not enough for an older adult to provide you with a decision for choosing a treatment, but we need to make sure that they understand that there are alternative treatments and then give the rationale for the treatment that they are choosing in the instance. And we need to make sure they understand the risk and benefits. Does the patient fully understand the treatment situation and choices? And can they appreciate the consequences of a treatment choice? And appreciation is very important for assessing capacity because if a person is in a situation, they might tell you, yes, this is the treatment I want, but if they don't really understand it, then they can't appreciate and really make a rational informed decision regarding what will be the best decision for them as far as treatment. So next what we'll do is we'll go over the components of mental capacity assessments and so let's see what this looks like in order for us to understand what to assess and then what not to do whenever we're assessing capacity in order to make decisions as far as whether or not the older adult is able to make rational decisions and understand those decisions. What is decisional capacity? So it's when we talk about understanding, we're talking about attention, memory and language, awareness, appreciation, understanding the consequences. Then there's intentionality. So if an older adult has this ability to understand and they have appreciation and the attention seems to be okay, the memory's intact, well, we have to recognize whether or not there is intentionality. So a plan versus an unplanned behavior, do they have a plan for doing something and are they doing it in a voluntary manner free from coercion? But then there's this idea of decision-making capacity, so decisional capacity, and this is the ability to understand the meaning and consequences of information and medical interventions. What this means is to make and implement intentional plans of care, make voluntary choices without coercion or manipulation. Then there's executive capacity, which also allows a person to function safely and independently in the community. And this is a very important piece of capacity. It's a relatively new area of capacity because for a long time we've thought that, well, capacity is mainly the ability to understand a outcome that we're facing, understand our decisions, and have good memory and language, but then there's this idea of being able to actually carry out specific tasks in order for us to maintain safe and independent living. And so when we think about executive capacity, we think about executive functional 
ability. So the ability for someone to orchestrate really simple ideas, movements, or actions into goal-directed behaviors. And without executive functions, behaviors important for independent living are expected to break down into their component parts. And what this means is individuals who have poor executive capacity are unable to take small tasks that are required for a goal-oriented behavior and put them in the sequence and order and timing in order to achieve that goal-oriented behavior. And executive capacity, as I mentioned, has been this missing piece of capacity assessments. And it includes direction, planning, execution, sequencing, and supervision of the behavior. And here's some executive function disorders that have been linked to deficits in executive function. So dementia, depression, cerebral vascular disease, diabetes, nutritional deficiencies, and then also just normal aging. So how does executive capacity work? What is the neuroanatomy? What are the neuroanatomical explanations for deficits in executive capacity? So when we think about executive capacity, we think about the frontal lobe. It's divided into three regions. So the mesiofrontal, the orbital frontal, and the dorsolateral. And these different regions are all involved in some form of the executive capacity, such as for the mesiofrontal, we have apathy, distractibility, and the failure to keep behavior targeted goals. And these are very, very important for being able to live safe and independently in the home. Now, there's also orbital frontal, which results in irritability. Whenever we have deficits in this region, we have irritability, mood lability, which is an intense mood change or shift, resistance to care, especially if threatening. And these are all behaviors that we see very commonly in older adults who are refusing to provide themselves with the care or accept care from others come in to provide them services. And there's also dorsolateral. This is a impaired planning, so hypothesis testing, judgment, insight, perseveration, concrete thinking. And what occurs here is when you have deficits in the dorsolateral region, then these people are unable to make adequate plans and unable to develop new ways of overcoming obstacles in their environment. And this becomes very important because people may continue to do the same thing they've always done to address the situation when in reality, they need a new approach to overcome that individual problem, but yet they're not able to do that. And so the medical approach to capacity, it's often difficult to assess all pieces of capacity. So unless there's a skilled psychiatrist or a forensic psychiatrist. Now physicians are very well trained and able to assess the basics of daily living as described in this slide. And so decision making regarding medical tests and interventions, this is very important because when an older adult comes in, oftentimes there's a lot of decisions to be made as far as their treatment, as far as their placement, their living conditions, and we need to understand whether or not they're able to make these decisions in a way that they understand and that they can apply value to because respecting the autonomy and the value of the older adult is very important, but also we want to keep them safe. And that moves us to the second point, which is capacity for self-protection. We want to make sure that these individuals are able to provide self-protection when needed. And then they need to be able to make decisions as far as their living situation. And physicians are primarily focused on medical decision-making capacity, but may be called upon in cases of elder abuse and mistreatment because, as I mentioned, capacity is a big risk factor. Whenever you have deficits in capacity, it puts a person at a high risk for abuse because they then become dependent on another person whenever another person is available or they become preyed upon by other individuals due to this vulnerability or limitation. And so there is a new paradigm in capacity assessment, and this is the assessment of decision-making capacity alone. Is it adequate? And that's, that's a question that we're facing now because exploring capacity and self-care and protection are very important, but the critical link here is the intentionality to execute. So this is a practical and simple way of assessing capacity. If someone can, oftentimes they can talk about doing things and the need to do things, but then do they have an intention to actually do it? That is, that is very important. And so how not to screen for capacity? Well, one is we don't want to just ask someone, especially in cases of elder abuse and mistreatment, are they being abused? Are they not being abused? If they lack capacity, 
they may not even understand that they're being abused. And having a simple conversation and nothing else often is not adequate for addressing capacity because as we mentioned, someone can have intact memory, language, understanding, but they may lack that executive capacity and when you have a conversation with someone it gets very deceptive because they can often talk about the things they need to do and talk about what they want to do, but then they can't take that those small task and put them into the sequence and order in order to achieve that goal-oriented behavior, which is that definition of lack of executive capacity. So that's why it's also important not to simply use expressions of a preference as the criteria for having capacity. And then we shouldn't apply a cutoff of the mini mental state exam score to assess cognitive impairment because a lot of individuals with really high educations may be able to score well on this test, but this test doesn't necessarily assess for executive capacity or executive function. And then we don't want to attribute abnormal scores as a life cycle choice without evidence. And we don't want to disregard individual habits or standards of behavior. So what are some tests for decisional capacity? Well, there's the psychiatric interview, which is considered the gold standard for decisional capacity. There's neuropsychological testing. A more sensitive screening tool than others for detecting early dementia is helpful in characterizing the pattern of cognitive impairment, depression, alcoholism, type of dementia. A referral is usually required in order to receive this test. Then there's the Hopkins competency assessment test, MacArthur competency assessment test, and there's a forensic psychiatry exam which includes a home visit. And that home visit is very important because this goes back to the idea of, of being able to do something about the situation and have that executive capacity to, to carry out goals and things for safety and protection because if an assessment is done outside of the home, well, these individuals may score well on a test, but when you get to their home, you'll see that they're unable to actually do the things they need to do in order to maintain their health and quality of life. And so with neuropsychological testing, it is an excellent resource for difficult or subtle cases. And there's four neuropsychological tests are designed to examine a variety of cognitive abilities, including speed of information processing. There's attention, there's memory, language, and executive functions necessary for the goal-directed behavior. And then also neuropsychological testing is an important tool for examining the effects of toxic substances and medical conditions on brain functioning. So what are some tests for executive capacity? So we have the clock drawing test or the clock drawing test and this is an easy test to administer and what it does it requires an older adult or whoever is receiving this test to draw a clock and then put a certain time in this clock. They don't have to draw a circle it's already drawn for them then they draw the numbers and put the time in as directed by the test. Then the second part of the test, which clocks two, an assessment where the individual has to draw the circle and then put the numbers and the time in. And often this is really revealing for whether or not a person has the executive capacity because usually whenever they go to the second clocks two drawing, that's where you start seeing the deficits in the executive capacity because they end up having spatial problems and other types of executive capacity issues. Then there's the exit interview. It's a 25-item interview that takes 15 to 20 minutes to complete and is designed to be administered at the bedside by non-neuropsychiatrically trained personnel. It's a fairly simple tool also to administer, and the really important piece is that you, know, you don't have to have that neuropsychiatric background to be able to administer it and get reliable results. Then there's the Coleman Evaluation Living Skills Test. This links intentionality and executive function. This is really more of an objective assessment of whether or not a person is able to carry out their instrumental activities of daily living, such as bathing, cooking, cleaning, taking care of their finances, and then receiving help or emergency services when needed, or making also the proper medical decisions based on certain conditions. Then there's the forensic psychiatry exam with home visit by occupational therapist. So in summary, the inclusion of executive capacity assessments represents a new paradigm for mental capacity and it's really an important piece because it really gets at that intentionality and the ability of a person to carry out the task and the goals that they 
have proposed whenever they're having a discussion with someone who's, who's sitting in front of them. And then there's the Kells test that can be used to determine capacity and then research is needed to establish tools for field use and this is important because a lot of these tests are used in a clinical setting. We need tools that can also be used out in the field to gain reliable indications of whether or not someone has capacity because as we mentioned doing assessments in the home is very important for understanding whether or not a person can actually carry out the task and make the decisions that they need to maintain safety and independence. So here's a case presentation. So this was a 78 year old woman reported to Adult Protective Services for living in squalor and just briefly Adult Protective Services they are the state agencies that were developed in 1975 to provide services to individuals 18 years to 64 years of age who have a disability and then older adults 65 and older who have been subjected to some sort of abuse. So here we have a 78 year old woman who's been reported for living in squalor. Now she admits to hypothyroidism and cigarette smoking and she takes hydrocodone and levothyroxine. She states that she saw her physician about three weeks ago. She lives with a former employee of her deceased husband who buys her groceries and prepares her meals. Now upon exam, she's a thin woman with very little muscle mass, long gray hair. Her vital signs reveal a low temperature of 95.8 degrees, normal blood pressure, and she is extremely weak. So when the mini mental state exam was conducted, she scored a 27 out of 30, which this is very important because this shows that she has the mental capability of taking care of herself. So she has that memory, language, and recall type abilities. But when we evaluated her Coleman evaluation of living skills, which if you remember, this is an assessment that assesses capacity, she scored an eight out of 16. And anything over a five and a half indicates the need for assistance to live safely and independently in the home. Now, when asked about the filth in her home, she calmly states, I know it's quite messy in my home, but I've not felt uh, too well recently. I will have the place cleaned up in two weeks. I'm hiring someone to do the cleaning and having a shed built in the backyard to store things that I no longer need in the house. So I will not trip and fall. I just need to get home so I can get things done. Well, here's another picture of her home. And you might guess what that is on the, on the floor. And so does this patient have decisional capacity? Why or why not? The patient has decisional capacity because she passed MMSE. So based on the standards, does she have, is she able to make decisions? Well, the test assesses attention, memory, and language, and she understands the consequences. So she did well on the MMSE, and some might say, well, she does have that decisional capacity, and therefore might release her as being, having capacity to live safely and independently. This patient does not have decisional capacity because she was coerced into making her decision. This patient does not have decisional capacity because she lacks attention, memory, language skills based on her MMSE score. Well, as we've mentioned, she has passed the MMSE. She got a 27 out of 30, which was indicative of her having the ability to you know, pay attention and recall things that are normal for daily living. So, in essence, this person does have decisional capacity because she passed the MMSC. The test measures attention, memory, and language, and she understands the consequences. Okay. Now, does this patient have executive capacity? Why or why not? This patient does not have executive capacity. Although she can state that she needs to clean and build a shed, she has yet to do so. Thus, she cannot turn simple actions into goal-directed behaviors or this patient has executive capacity because she has a plan to clean up her home within two weeks, or this patient has executive capacity because she states that she will have a shed built for more storage. Now, as we mentioned before, you know, the ability for a person to tell you the things they need to do and actually do the things they need to do, there's a distinction there, and that is that distinction is made clear by executive capacity limitations. And so in this case, this patient does not have executive capacity. She's able to state that she needs to clean up and build a shed, but she has not yet done this. She is unable to turn simple actions into goal-directed behaviors, which is the definition of limited executive capacity. So 
Here's the case presentation outcome. So the lab testing revealed mild dehydration, sodium levels at 149, an albumin of 3.4, and a thyroid stimulating hormone of 60. Neuropsychiatric testing showed a lack of capacity, both executive and decisional capacity, and the patient was moved to safety with her daughter 300 miles away. And this over to the right is actually a very, very important quote by Linda Farber Post, who says that honoring the wishes of a person with capacity demonstrates respect for the individual. And this is a big part of maintaining, respecting, and valuing people's autonomy, but also honoring the wishes of a person without capacity is a form of abandonment. And the distinction is so far as it can be reliably made, and it's absolutely critical because if we leave individuals with limited decisional or executive capacity living in the home by themselves, it puts them at great risk for limited quality of life and then also mortality. Okay, thank you.